Welcome to Garden Grounds. Welcome to the Rusted Garden. Today is uh, my live Q&A, mentoring Q&A that I do uh, publicly every second, fourth Thursday, 11 a.m. I'll do a public live and it's really about just answering your garden questions. I do have a little bit to talk about with respect to a theme, but feel free to put out any question that you have. I also have a perk membership where you can pay a monthly fee. I do this Q&A four times a month. I do a couple live classes, um, but the groups are smaller. It's like 20 to 40 people. I can answer every question. All the Q&As go on for about an hour or so like that. But again, this is a public Q&A and slowly people will be rolling in, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so go ahead and throw your questions out there. Good morning, Connie and Joanne. Hi, Wendy. I'm, you know, transitioning as a lot of us are over from summer crops to the fall crops. I want to talk about the four main really frost hardy, cold hardy crops that I think are wonderful to grow. But I'm going to give it a little bit of time so more people can sign in. It's only about a minute after 11 o'clock. If you uh, guys have any questions, please, you know, throw them out there. I'll do my best to answer them. I do have a blog now, so a lot of, if you follow me and you watch my videos, a lot of my videos cover information. And instead of having to take notes or write down spray recipes, I've really put a lot of love into my blog. You can find it here. And not all the videos, but most of the videos going forward, if it's lengthy, if it's about a recipe, um, if it's recipe for sprays, bug sprays, fungicides, etc. If it's a recipe for cooking or anything detailed, you can just go to my blog, read the article, copy that, and this way you don't have to take notes off the video. And good morning, Julie, Heather, and Gail. And if you notice, they have stars next to their name. They are part of the Perk memberships, and they could speak, and Nikki could speak, you know, Hopefully, they, I know that they do find value, but find value in the perk memberships. All right, so let's get started with questions. Please throw out a question. Um, and also, I, I see uh, polites. I'll answer that in a second. Because so much is a big, so much is going to, yeah. Why can't I say that? So much is going to be going through the chat. Please put the word question in front so that I can pick it out from what's going on. But Polite says, what plants besides peppers can you winterize and replant the next year? So for people that don't know, peppers, if you don't get a frost or you don't have temperatures that hang out in the 40s, they are pretty much woody shrubs and they will continue to grow. So you can cut them back. You can put them in a place that is protected. They go dormant and then you can replant them. And in theory, you get a bigger plant growing. I don't know of other plants like a pepper plant, like most of your garden plants, tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, all the, all they all have to be replanted. You do have perennial herbs, but they don't really require you to do much in protecting. So like you have to actually dig a pepper plant out of the ground, put it into a pot, prune it back, um, you stop watering it, and then you just secure it in a place to where it's gonna stay. Really, it's gotta, I mean, in the 40s, it'll probably survive, but you really want it to be in a place where it's 50 degrees or above. If you get too warm, it's going to try and grow, and that can be problematic inside. But that is the only plant that I'm aware of. And if people are listening, please, you know, if you can help out Polite with other options of plants you can winterize, please let them know. All right. All right, let's see. Egg, it looks like eggplant maybe you can do that with. I did not know that. So that could be something you can cut back too. Uh, cheers to uh, the UK in the rainy UK. So one of the things I wanna do, I mean, we're kind of on the same, we are, same summer, same winters. I wanna get involved more with gardeners from different continents and different places and different countries and all the way across the other side to Australia that is, they're going to be growing all their summer crops while we go into our winter. I think it'd be just a lot of fun to stay in touch with people everywhere. Becky, yeah, the YouTube doesn't make it easy, but I promise that if you if you get a laptop or a desktop and you go to my YouTube channel, The Rusted Garden, 
you'll see a join button and you click that and then you can select the options. You should be able to see it on your phone too, but it is harder to find. But there, there really is a join button sitting there. There's also links in all my videos that take you to my YouTube landing page. But if you're not seeing that join button pop out, um, I wish I could help you more. But thank you for trying anyway and considering. KT, uh, good morning, grubs were... Good morning. Grubs were in my deck container of potatoes. Toss the potting soil? No. So grubs can be all kinds of different things. Here in Maryland, we get Japanese beetles and their grubs are everywhere. And if I were to throw out my potting soil, they're only gonna come back year after year. I'm gonna spend a lot of money. They're in all of my earth beds. You could potentially have certain grubs that chew the roots of your plants, but a lot of times they don't damage them enough. The only time that you would want to get rid of a soil is if your plants are growing and they die off and something bad happens and then I would get rid of the potting mix. But I would just let them go. If you find them as you're digging through, just toss them out. But grubs aren't something you have to over, you know, worry about. They're just there and there's just so many kinds. You're never going to be able to keep them out of your soil. Question. Can you plant sweet potatoes in the fall? Good question. They are not related to potatoes. Some potatoes that are shorter days, like the regular tuber potato, you can plant and grow. Sweet potatoes need a good 100, 120 days of growth. They accelerate and thrive in the hot weather. So you really have to plant those here in Maryland, similar mid-May, and you want them to be able to grow the entire way. If you plant them now, they are frost tender. So are potatoes, but they can kind of overwinter. Um, your sweet potatoes aren't going to do a whole lot. They're, in fact, they're, they're not going to grow. If you are in a place that doesn't get a frost, they still love that 80, 90 degree temperatures. So you might have a mild fall and a mild winter, but they really need the heat to thrive. Question from Julie. Last week I told you about my melon garden bed, which succumbed to blight. The vines are truly dead. No, so we'll clear them out. Are dead now, so I guess I will clear them in. Can I plant this bed next spring? Yes, you can. So diseases, if it's blight, fungus, anything that comes and contacts your plant leaves, any plant, floats in the air, overwinters on weeds. When you first built a garden, you didn't have any diseases there, but you put in your plants and the diseases found it. They've been doing that. The fungi have been doing that for millions of years. So you can plant and the disease is going to come back. And this is why I recommend people to really take notes and put down, you know, when the disease shows up. You want to start spraying a good two weeks, three weeks before the diseases show up. And you can pick any kind of fungicide. You can check out my channel. Follow me if you don't follow me already. Um, and I'll be going over that plan. Of how do you create a prevention plan in your garden? I do that every year. But you really just want to plant and you want to start spraying regularly with a routine and that will keep the blights and stuff at bay. Um, hydrogen peroxide works really well. I have it set up and I use it on my tomatoes. You can adjust the formula, try it on your plants. Like if it's the season is starting to end, mix up a batch of hydrogen peroxide spray. Start spraying some of your plants that you don't care if they get damaged because you want to test spray that hydrogen peroxide see if the plant gets any damage from it and you might have a weapon you know for next time all right just finding where i left off here Okay, if I could answer, how do you get rid of bugs that eat my false seedlings? I would be a rich man and I would spread the wealth. The only way to do it is to sort of identify the bugs that show up and put a plan in place. Like seedlings often get killed off by snails and slugs. I just actually have this here. I am not affiliated with them, but this is a slug and uh, snail killer. It has sulfur. I recommend any slug bait that has sulfur as the main ingredient or iron phosphate. It is a good 
bait to use and you scatter it liberally around your garden, that will kill off the snails and slugs. They won't go after your seedlings. If it's not snails and slugs, you might have to put like an insect dust on there, like Captain Jack's dead bug dust, which is organic. So you have to put a plan in place to control the insects. The insects come at different times. Um, again, I would take notes, but right now going from summer to fall, Snails and slugs are really active and they really do go after the seedlings. So I would try, I would start, you know, with um, the snail and slug bait. Clite, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, and the phone is small, so it's hard to find all those join buttons, the join button. It's probably in some menu, but I haven't been able to find it. India, um, and I saw your question, but make sure you guys, if you're new to the Q&A, the public Q&A, um, put question in there. I'll miss it. Um, if you notice that I miss your question, feel free to repost it. And we're going to stay on for, you know, a good 45 minutes from 11 o'clock. She asks, are there certain carrots and beans that can be grown fall and winter? So carrots can manage a frost a bit. They can deal with that. Um, I'm not familiar of beans that can really take a frost. Some of them can take colder weather. Um, but if you're talking about like string beans or green beans and stuff like that, they're frost tender. So you can't really grow them. So let's go to kind of the subject for today we're moving into the fall the frost is going to come lots of plants can be planted in the garden now their leaves can actually freeze and their cells don't burst which means they don't get damaged and when the sun comes in the morning they defrost and they're good to go it's when the ground freezes like a good inch for a prolonged period that it starts killing off these cool weather crops these frost tolerant crops so there's a lot you can grow from September, really in my area into November, and my hard freezes don't really come anymore until later December or something like that. So the crops that are really winter hardy that I recommend you trying are spinach and kale. That's two of them. Kale, spinach in Maryland can take 20 degree nights, 20 degree days, prolonged periods, and it stays intact. Not all varieties, but most of them do here in Maryland. And then come the spring, the kale actually grows and puts out hundreds of buds and flowers that are edible and you can eat. And you can still eat some of the leaves. Because they're biennials, they're trying to go to seed and you could collect seed that way too. Spinach just is really hardy. So come early spring, that overwintered spinach in my garden gets huge. I have spinach, I have kale as I'm getting in the new spring crops. Other things that do really well, are radishes they can take a pretty good freeze the radish can can't really freeze but it can take some you know good temperatures but radishes grow really quickly they grow you know anywhere from 28 to 45 days from germination so i would keep planting radishes every two weeks three weeks until you put in a crop of radishes and they just don't make it that's the way that you can figure out what do i do with these cool weather crops like i can tell you what to plant. I can't tell you how long you can plant them in your garden. So if you start planting, if you keep a journal and you put in radishes today, I think, what's today? The 14th. Once they germinate, two weeks after that, put in some more. That might put you at like, whatever, September 20th. Once the ones planted on the 20th um, germinate, two weeks later, put in some more. And keep notes and you can kind of get a sense of how long you can plant radishes in your garden before that heavy freeze comes. And you can do that with all your plants um, that are going into the garden in the fall. Uh, lettuce too. Uh, romaine lettuce is really hardy. That is a good loose leaf lettuce. It does form a soft head that you can really grow and I do recommend that. And if you like endive, endive does really well. Those are the crops that really can take heavier frosts bigger freezes and you can keep them going if you have a cold frame you can put those into a cold frame and plant them and you can probably grow in maryland all the way 
through January. The plants are going to be more active. The radishes are going to form up. The lettuce will keep going and you can keep harvesting. But those are the main ones that I recommend giving, get it, giving them a try for extended growing. All right, so I got to roll back, find some questions. All right, all right. Looking, looking. Um, he, I was like Heckenels. He knows and cares. Do fly larvae make beneficial frass? I don't know the answer to that. Don't know the quantity. Um, frass is usually collected from insects, and I believe it repels other insects and stuff like that. Um, I know that it's true. I know that it's effective. I just don't know on the quantities and what it works on, what it doesn't work on. Sorry. I'm glad you caught the live stream. Polite question from Kay. How do you get rid of... Oh, we did that one. Yeah, that, you know, you just have to have a routine, really. Uh, just uh, pyrite. How do I manage cucumber beetles? I tried covering them, trellis and plants. So I get cucumber beetles. I manage them and I have videos on it. If you go and look up um, cucumber beetles, I believe, or cucumber care, you'll find it. I put insect dust on the outer leaves of my cucumber plants, away from the flowers. You can use Captain Jack's dead bug, dead, <laughs> dead bug dust. That is organic. You can use seven dust. It is not organic, but on the outer leaves, on a couple of leaves, if that's all you can get, it's really effective. Anyway, any insect dust, not diatomaceous earth, that is a dust, but it's silica. Um, so you want Captain Jack's that has spinosad in it or something like seven that has a chemical insect killer. You put it on late in the evening, outer leaves, the cucumber beetles are really active, they run through it, you're gonna see them dead on the leaf the next day. If you want, you can wash it off so that it doesn't blow on the flowers and get good insects. Um, and then reapply it. But I use insect dust and it's really, really effective to manage the cucumber beetles. Netting and all that stuff isn't gonna work because they're just gonna crawl in and crawl in under it and get to the uh, plant. And a lot of what I talk about is you might do the dust, you know, every Monday for the period the cucumber beetles are really active and you get them under control and they just don't damage your cucumber plants. And it's never about perfection either that you're not going to be able to stop something 100%. But you can maybe knock it back to only, you know, it does, let me figure out how to say it, that you're 90% successful. So it only damages 10%. So you reduce the damage down and increase the success of growing the plants. And they do really well. And that's what the routines do. All right, buzzing through here. Um, KDMC, when's the best time to plant rosemary in Texas? I'm not sure, and I saw your bold, but everybody make sure you put question in front of your question or I'm going to miss it. So rosemary likes drier soil, which is, you got heat in Texas for sure. I think it would be best planted, and it can take, you know, light frosts and stuff, probably in your fall so that it gets really established and gets stronger for the heat. I wouldn't plant it, obviously, during, you know, June, July, August. September, I'm not sure what your temperatures do, but I really feel like, you know, October, November is fine to get rosemary and you can get most of your perennial herbs in there and they'll just have a cooler period. They'll do better. They'll establish and they'll be able to take the more extreme conditions come next time. Plight has a good point too. I used to, I have a lot of fertilizer. Like I got a 28, I think it was like a 28 pound bag, whatever that huge bag of plant tone um, comes in from Espoma. They're usually like, I don't know, say let's just say $25. I got dozens of bags, maybe it was 27 pounds. Anyway, it was two or three bucks because they go on sale. So if you're on the East Coast, unfortunately on the West Coast where you can garden all year long, this doesn't happen. 
but as our winters roll in, all the stuff starts going on sale and you can get fertilizers and all kinds of stuff at a great discount. I do want to say hi to everybody. I wish I could, you know, this would be great if it was in person. It'd be a lot better. But hello, Jane. Can I put sweet pea seeds in September so they flower quickly in spring? Or should I wait until April, May to plant them out in the soil? Um, let me think. I don't know how hardy the sweet pea seeds are, and I don't know if they're going to start to grow because of your temperatures. Um, maybe they'll stay dormant. So some people plant seeds now, like you can, some people put in onion seeds. Um, believe it or not, I can put sunflower seeds into my garden in December, and if I can work the soil, and that they are going to grow the next year, and they grow really quickly, and they grow early. So I think that's what you're talking about with the sweet pea seeds. Because I don't know, I would experiment. I And this is what I always recommend. It doesn't have to be yes or no. It could be find a place in your garden, you know, mark it, take notes, put in some sweet pea seeds, and just see how they do from, you know, planting now, and see if they germinate more quickly quickly in the spring or they get growing better in the spring if that's the idea is to kind of put them in they stay dormant and they come back stronger I would always go with collect information and then experiment and you know don't plant an entire garden full just do a couple containers or a couple earth beds and see how it goes Nina should I pull my summer plants that are still producing only if you want to um my stuff is starting to die off, so I am starting to pull it more, and I'm reducing my tomatoes down to the best plants. But if they're not really going to have time to produce new fruit to maturity, maybe take what you have. Um, I'm really making an effort to get my fall garden in. I have a rabbit somewhere in my garden. I just walk the entire garden. It's not that big. I mean, it's big with a stick and like, you know, kind of brushed under the fig tree and in corners can't find it maybe there's a hole in my fence anyway it sheared down like seven kale plants it sheared down my lettuce um and it's really messing things up so if you have a fence make sure you shut the gate all the time because i left it open overnight and you know a week ago and i think a rabbit moved in urban chicken mama and nina are also perk members um First time growing edamame, how do I know when it's ready to harvest? It takes a long time and I have not been successful with it. And it is something that you plant later when it's warmer and hotter because it loves that. Um, and I don't know. So <laughs> I, I failed on that one. Laura, you're planting brassicas this weekend. How can I keep bugs away? Netting. Um, netting is good if you can close it to the ground and it stops that white mop, white butterfly that lays worms on there, um, green caterpillars, army worms, etc. That works really well. Um, if you're getting snails and slugs, earlier I talked about using snail and slug bait with iron phosphate or sulfur. That works really well. But you basically have to come up with a plan. Like I had to go, I was just talking about rabbits, cover all my stuff now with chicken wire just in case that rabbit comes out. So you would just have to sort of come up with a plan and stick with it. If it's spraying neem oil or putting down dust, um, covering it with ag fabric, come up with a routine and that's gonna help you the most. Heather, should I divide cukes since I planted too many? All I came up and, it's a f and this is a first to have healthy and too many in a container. Yes, you should divide them if you can. Um, I mean, you just, if the roots are all together and you divide them, you could damage all the plants and they'll recover, but they're gonna grow slowly. So if you wanna try and divide them, definitely do that. Uh, if not, just remove some. I know it's, a, it's not what we like to do, but remove them, put them into compost and let them die off and cut them. Don't pull out the roots. This way, the roots of the plants that are staying in the container stay intact, well-developed, and see how it goes. 
KT, after planting something, what plants should you not plant in the same spot? That's a really big question, and I am not a big uh, worrier about what you can't plant in the same spot. And I'm, I'm assuming you're saying if you plant something, removes it, and you put something else in, there's one way to look at it. If you're adding in compost and you're taking care of your soil, you can just keep putting stuff in there. Crop rotation and all that kind of stuff is really for bigger scale gardens, not the home garden, because we can take care of each section of our garden and we're always adding stuff to it. If you planted something and it's growing and you're worried, what if you plant something next to it, if they'll kind of interact with each other? I don't worry too much about that. You can find so much on the internet. The only thing that I have found is that if you have young sunflowers growing next to plants, the sunflowers do impact the growth of the plants around there. They secrete something from their roots. It, te it keeps the other plants from competing with them. If you have a sunflower, a sunflower plant that is really mature, it's established and you can plant around it. But that's the only one I've, I've ever worried about. Joanne, uh, most of the stuff you can see what I'm planting are in the videos. Uh, but right now, kale, radishes, carrots, spinach, lettuce, endive, those are the main ones that I'm planting. So I have to stop planting really in November unless I set up something, but I would still plant the same things. It would be the cool weather crops as long as I can go. Garlic in Oklahoma. I don't know how cold Oklahoma gets, but you want to plant your garlic, the hard neck garlic, really. Soft neck garlic, you can plant, um, and you can also plant hard neck, or I'm sorry, soft neck garlic in the spring. But hard neck garlic likes a period of cold to really develop nice cloves. Um, here in Maryland, the ground starts freezing in December. I will put garlic in in November, even early December. You just want to get it, get it into the ground two inches deep, let it establish. I can also put garlic in in October. It'll grow some greenery. That greenery will get all beat up, but the clove still establishes. So I don't know if that helps you, but, um, you know, that's the time frame. Soft neck garlic can go in now in Maryland, and it does get, I think the cloves get a little bit bigger if they overwinter, but I also plant them in January, February, early March. I put in a clove of the soft neck in about an inch deep into my ground, and I get cloves, and they're about I mean, the bulbs are about that big. You know, they're not huge, but I get garlic that way. Nina, um, I do have a podcast too. If you guys actually go, see if it's still there. If you, I put it into the chat. If you go to my um, blog, The Rustic Garden Journal, you can see all my podcasts. I just started doing that again, and I'm doing that every two weeks. You can also find the Rusted Garden Homestead podcast wherever you would get, you know, your podcasts. Um, so your question, <laughs> as I got distracted. So I did plant onions. So I'm planting onions that are about this big, really tiny. Onions are biennials. If you can get the timing right, Plant your onions now, they get established, but they still think they're baby first year onions and then they go dormant. Come spring, they still think they're first year onions. They're gonna grow and they're gonna develop you know, nice onions. If you put them in too early, they get too big, they consider themselves an adult this year. They overwinter and the next year they come back and they send out that big flower stalk and flower and they don't really form well. So I've experimented with it before. This year, um, I just happened to come across onions in a container. This is how I grow them too. It was at some hardware store. And there's probably like 100 onions in there, just overseeded, but they were small. So I'm, I'm planting them now. So to answer your question, you can put in, you know, six week, eight week old onions into the ground now. And I would experiment, see how they do. Seeds, I'm not sure about. I've never put seeds into the ground in September and see how the onions did the following year. It's always been transplants. And they're really like, I mean, skinny. It's like, you know, an onion seed you put in, it's been growing there for four weeks or so. It's not really big, 
but I'm just popping them, you know, into my garden. And again, I'm going to say it, people are get tired of me saying it, but experiment, you know, pick a small spot, a small spot in your garden and just, you know, maybe plant some seeds or maybe start growing some um, seedlings now and, and see how that goes. Okay, I'm trying to get a bed prepped for garlic. Should I take out all the roots? I don't know if I leave them, will it affect the garlic? I wouldn't, you know, more and more, like there's no dig gardening, no till gardening and stuff, and you still have to dig at times, but you can cut summer stuff away, leave the roots in the ground, and they're just gonna decay and break down. Maybe when you're planting the garlic, you wanna kind of loosen a pocket so that when you put in the clove, it'll be able to expand and grow pretty easily if the, the, the soil is compact. But you don't have to get in and loosen it to like 10 inches or 12 inches everywhere, pull out all the roots. You can just kind of loosen the space where the bulbs are going and let it go. Um, uh, Jane, I don't know if you're asking the question, but yes, they can. All right. Um, this is what I use. This is just ortho bug getta, snail and slug killer, effective. Um, if you go to my Amazon shop, if you go to any of my videos and you just find in the description where there's the Amazon shop links, I have this kind of stuff listed in there. Just pick any video and you can get there. All right, I'm just trying to catch up here, find out where. Um, Shirley, do you recommend trimming extra cucumber vines? I do. I mean, I prune my cucumbers from the bottom up, give them some space. Uh, if a new vine is growing out, I'll let it flower a little bit and then I'll, I'll cut it. You know, you don't have to remove it all the way to the stem, but just, you know, t cut off the growing tip and that helps. So it's a good problem to have when you have too much growing. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for getting my book. And I also have another book coming out. Where, yeah, right there. Growing an Edible Landscape. It was scheduled to be released on November 7th. It's been pushed back to November 28th. Um, but you can find it on Amazon or wherever. If you pre-order, people always worry. The books go down in price. So Amazon competes against me, but it, it's fine. So the book is $24.99. And as more books sell, hopefully, the price goes down. So if you pre-order now at the $24.99 price and the price lowers by the time the 28th comes, you get the lower price. Amazon states that. Sometimes that worries people that they're paying more, but the book is going to go down in price. Heather, I take garlic. I'll go to my local roots, which is an organic place, and I will buy their hard neck garlic. That's the one that has the hard stem. I've even planted the soft neck garlic from any grocery store, as long as the whole bulb is intact and the roots aren't cut off or anything like that, you can grow that garlic. I also sometimes get online and I will just search um, garlic and look at a couple websites, compare prices and pick, you know, something that way. Doris, can I still plant sweet potato slips? Um, somebody asked us ask that. And if you're in a place where it truly becomes fall and frost, no, you can't. Sweet potatoes need a good 100, 110, 120 days of warmth, of summer war warmth to really produce. I have not been able to overwinter sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes that stay in the ground tend to die off in my area. You can dig up sweet potatoes and you can store them in a cool place over the winter and then you can, you know, put them in water or soil and you can grow slips and you can replant them. At least I haven't had success here in Maryland. Devil Dog, that's good. So you plant onion seeds at the end of September they give a nice harvest midsummer, so you have proof right there. And you're in area six. Sharon, I put my onion transplants in now, um, and we're close enough that it's the same. I was just doing that this morning, actually. 
Oh, we are at 11.34, so we've got a good 10 minutes or so. Clyte bush beans. Do those plants die off when they are finished producing? They do. I mean, they, they produce and they get a little bit beat up. And anything, they can come back, but you're better off just replanting and getting new uh, vigorous bush beans growing. I mean, usually we plant the bush beans, we get a harvest, probably get a second harvest. And if you, you keep them alive, they will grow a little bit more. I find bush beans, different varieties are sort of misleading. Some of them only get like whatever, let's say uh, two feet tall. Some of them are like semi-determinate where they get three feet or four feet and they keep going and producing. So the term bush and pole beans, there's a lot in between. So it depends on the variety that you're growing. All right, so I'm actually at the end of the chat. So if I missed your question, please throw it back out there. But I'm down at the bottom, and I'm just going to watch to see what, what's coming up. Sharon, you're very welcome. I enjoy it. So I appreciate you know being able to talk with you and with everybody. I really I just enjoy it. It's, it's a passion. Here's my blog again. You can find my podcast there. So Nina, next year will be the third year using the same soil in some of my pots. Do I need to replace it? I would just refresh it. I mean, some people throw it out, but my brother and I, and I have videos on it, I just, you know, if it's been three years or so, or maybe two years if I feel like I need to add to it, even four years if I if I made really great stuff, put it all into a, on a tarp, everything. I just, and I tend to dump all the containers out, like I just do it on a three-year rotation. Um, because it's too hard to keep track of them. Put them onto a tarp, throw in peat moss, throw in organic granular. I have lots of compost now. Throw in some compost. Uh, nothing fancy, like you don't need specific measures. Fluff it all back together. Um, I use that as my base. Maybe when I'm filling the container, it's you know two thirds of the stuff I just made on a tarp. It's a little bit more compost or something like that. But you'll f you'll find that you don't. There's no need to throw it away. Just refresh it. And again, this is my public Q&A that I do, you know, a little bit of a theme, um, but I'll answer any questions that you guys have. I do this every second Thursday, fourth Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. I'll probably talk 45 minutes to an hour answering questions. I also have the PERC memberships, which is a, you know, you pay a monthly fee. Uh, it's all done through YouTube. You have to find the join button. Um, and you just hit join, select the perk membership that you want. I do this Q&A about four times a month. Stay on for a good hour, answer everybody's questions. And in that Q&A, that's only like 20 to 40 of us. I also do two live um, classrooms. I have a grow, as we, a grow As We Grow series where perk members will send me video questions or uh, tours of their garden and I put them together and we do a joint video release on my channel. All right, as I was chatting away, some stuff moved here. Jen, so the peppers and the indeterminate tomatoes and the green stalks did really well. Um, truth be told, I had so much planted that I totally missed watering them and it did damage them a little bit. But peppers grow extremely well in a green stalk. I recommend growing peppers in them. The uh, dwarf type determinate tomatoes, dwarf like Tiny Tim or Red Robin are best. You can grow some um, determinate varieties in the green stalk. They do really well, but so much grows in the green stalk. I mean, I highly recommend them. Oh, and this is a good time too. Thank you for the reminder indirectly. The rusted garden red green stalk is limited. It was last out maybe two or three years ago. They are bringing it back probably October. Um, I will let you know as soon as I know the date, but you can get the Rusted Garden Red into five tier green stalks. Um, I am affiliated with them. That's why they're doing this. If you go to any of my YouTube videos, you can find the green stalk link in there. 
use that, use my code, you'll save money, 10 bucks. And, you know, it, and it's worth it. I know it's a little bit expensive to purchase it, but the ones that are in my garden, um, one of them is at seven years and it hasn't cracked, it hasn't really faded, it's working really wonderfully. And when you cost this out over, you know, seven to 10 years, it's worth getting. And the reason I say that is because it's five tiers, 30 pockets, and it grows in a little two foot, you know, maybe three foot by three foot space. And you can just get so much out of it. But as soon as I know when the red rusted garden color is out, I will let you all know. Uh, Michelle, should I pull my squash plants to plant a winter garden? I would. Um, if you don't feel like you're going to get much out of that squash plant, there's no point in keeping it alive now. I think Devil Dog was saying he did seeds too. So you could do both. But I, I liked his comment because he's just putting in the seeds, you know, and because it's still fall, they're going to establish and germinate now, I think. Um, and they'll be there, but they're going to just stay small because it's going to get cold. And then come the spring, they take off and do really well. And thank you so much for the book. And if you guys have purchased my book, I'm trying to get the, um, why did I forget what it's called? Uh, reviews. I want to get to a thousand reviews. That helps me out. I think it's at like 650 reviews. Um, even if you didn't buy it on Amazon, if you find the Rusted Garden um, well, look up Gary Polarchek, P-I-L-A-R-C-H-I-K. You'll find both my books there. If you bought them and you like it, please um, leave a review. That would be great. Um, Donna, I would go ahead and plant some beets. They can, they can do pretty good even when it gets really uh, cold and the freezes start rolling in. But you will definitely get um, leafy greens you could eat. Sometimes beets over winter, depending on where you're at. Um, but again, this would be an example because it's warmer now. And unlike when you plant in the spring, the ground is really cold. So stuff germinates quickly. If you get carrots and beets and your cool weather crops in the ground now, because the soil is warm, they germinate really quickly and they grow faster. So you'll you have more time is my point from putting them in when it's warm going into the cool because they accelerate they germinate quickly and the growth accelerates quickly do i flip compost piles i i do both i have piles that are more for a breakdown over a six month period so i will turn those every once in a while i don't really do hot composting it's a lot of work and i find that if you do something you know a little bit of turning here and there everything still does break down in about a year. And I've been doing this for several years, so I always have compost that's ready. Thank you for the uh, support, Chicken Mama. So the towers, are they hard to water? So they do have a reservoir up top. I use that primarily when it's cooler because you fill it up and it trickles through the whole tower and it's effective. But once your plants get to a good size and the heat comes, that's really a hard way to water. So I actually just take the spray nozzle and I water each pocket. And it doesn't take that long because you, you just flood each tier, it floods, and then you go to the next one and the next one and the next one. So you, you can water that way and it, it doesn't really take a lot of time. They really are good growth systems. I like them too. You can get cheaper versions of vertical towers, but very often the sun degrades them and they crack and break. And very often the pockets are not deep enough. Like these hold, I think each tier, don't hold me to it, but close to it, hold seven gallons of material, potting mix. So you can really grow well in there. Julie, when to harvest acorn squash? Um, it usually will get a little bit of a yellowing to one side, but you can harvest it when it, you know, gets to like this size, depending on what you're growing. Nice dark green. It's kind of been sitting there a couple of weeks, um, not growing anymore. It's pretty much ready to harvest. 
they can sit on the vine for weeks and months too because their winter squash um, they store really well so once they really get to size and they, a couple of weeks pass you can you can harvest them Donald I don't know because I don't grow citrus trees I know that you do have to bring them in um, I'm not sure how sensitive sensitive they are to like 40 degree nights or 50 degree nights um, so I don't want to give you bad advice And Devil Dog, that's a good point too. That if like the beets that I have now still in my garden from the spring are like, some of them are this big. And believe it or not, spring plant planted beets don't get woody. They're just as tender as beets I picked in June. I can pick them now, but they're big. Growing in the fall, you know, he's talking about, you know, one inch or, well, he or she, devil dog could go either way. He or she is talking about harvesting at a half an inch to two inches. So you don't have to wait for them to get super sized. You can plant a lot of beets and harvest them smaller. That's a really good point I just wanted to stress. Thank you, Jen, for putting my book on your Christmas list. Yeah, did your, Julie, did they usually start a dark green and then get that gold yellow color to it but you know i'm just wondering did they start and go to gold um it's just interesting i you could transplant carrots but they send down a long tap root and once you pull that tap root and you twist it and move it it's all going to be kind of messed up um, i would just thin them down if you have like two carrots together or even three they're going to push each other out of the way. So you can leave three carrots together. If your soil is kind of hard, they are going to twist together. You never know what you're going to pull out of there. But taking the time, taking the time to thin your carrots, you're better off just thinning them and replanting. It's a lot of work. And your I don't think the reward, the reward is going to be that good. Um, what got you into planting? In my book, um, the first really two pages about my grandfather he would come to my house um when i was in well he'd come to my house since i was born but for the garden when i was in second grade third grade he would bring tomato plants in a bag old paper bag he'd carry a blue tin of maxwell house maxwell house coffee in it and a coffee can and in that can was lime and he would always just show me how to plant the tomatoes add lime plant some cucumber seeds and he basically just taught me how to grow a couple basic plants but introduced me to gardening and it stuck with me all my life julie i don't know what variety you have um most of my acorn squash start a dark green or green they stay a dark green and then you get just a little tiny, you know, yellowing gold color blush to it. And that's when I harvest them. But it'd be the same thing. As you're watching them grow, they get to a size, they stop growing. And then a couple weeks after, you can harvest. All right. We are at 1148. The Perk membership does four of these Q&As, an hour long every month if you're interested in that. Um, I was doing the public Q&A, which I'm doing today. And for those of you just signing on, I do this every second Thursday at 11 and fourth Thursday of the month at 11. Used to just be 30 minutes, but that just wasn't enough time because people were signing in. So this is always going to go about 45 minutes to an hour. So I'll stay on. I mean, we might as well just even it out to one hour. Any last questions? And remember, for the cool weather crops, the ones that I talked about, spinach, kale, lettuces, and radishes. Lettuces like romaine. That's the best one. I don't really like the loose, loose leaf ones like oak leaf. But a romaine um, and radishes are great winter crop or fall crops, cool weather crops, to keep planting until the harder freezes of winter come. 
And I do recommend put some seeds in, take notes, and watch and see how they grow as your cold weather really starts rolling in. And that's the best way to figure out for next year how to get the most production out of your fall garden because you will have taken notes today and you know through September, October, and you'll be able to reflect back and say, okay, I can plant radishes six times. I can keep the lettuce going really into December. Spinach overwinters in my area, I get, I get a great spring crop. And that's the best way to really learn about your kind of, it's not a unique microclimate, but your own unique garden and what grows best that way. All right. Just seeing if I missed any questions. If you put a question out there, this is not working. If you put a question out there and I missed it, please send it again. Because a lot does buzz through here pretty quickly. So here in Colorado, we get a good amount of snow. So certain things get covered in snow and snow is like an insulator and it keeps the stuff from getting really cold, like if a big freeze rolls in. So some plants do okay, but if it's, you know, for several days, it's going to damage the outer leaves of your lettuce. Um, light's not getting in there, um, but certain things like kale can be covered in snow they're fine sitting there at 32 degrees. And then when it defrosts or when it melts, it's still going okay. But it's really going to be about you're getting from, you know, frost and freeze at 32 to about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what plants can kind of freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, and they do okay. When you start getting into the prolonged periods of freeze, 25 degrees um, Fahrenheit and colder for prolonged periods, that's when your plants start dying off. Your ginger should be ready about now. I'm in Maryland Zone 7. I've been growing my ginger since about April. I've pulled out a little bit of the root and it looks great. I'm going to try and keep mine growing a little bit longer until I know that frost is rolling in. And once it does, I'm just going to harvest it all. I'm just trying to maximize. But with ginger, I mean, you can start pulling out pieces as of August, really, and you just pull it out as you need it. You don't, it, it's not like it's necessarily ready or not ready. It begins to grow the rhizomes and it gets the size and they're, you know, full of liquid and flavor. You can start breaking off pieces whenever you want. Ginger, and I don't know when you planted it, but it does really want, you know, like June, July, August some of May, some of September. I mean, it really does want a good 100 days of growing time just to get to a good size. Jen, the journal is the best. I can't remember what I planted a week ago. So, you know, <laughs> the journal is good. I mean, I'm lucky enough that I'll do videos and if I forget something, I can go back and watch it. But the journal is just nice. I mean, I don't even use a phone. It's too hard with dirty hands and water put it on the phone so I just use a journal or I bring out sheets of paper right on there it's all beat up I bring it back in maybe put it on a computer or something like that um, Immaculate I would go and watch my videos I'll, I'll answer it but I would go and watch my videos um, on growing ginger because it's a long growing period and I pre sprout mine in plastic bags I get the roots going I get the rhizomes growing and I start that really maybe in March I try and get them into the garden in April you have to protect it from frost but it's really April early May that you want to get your ginger in if you know the elderberry has dead branches you can trim them off for sure Jennifer my favorite I just like the tiny Tim it's Got a little bit more flavor than the other dwarf. Sometimes dwarf tomatoes don't have a great sweetness, but I like the Tiny Tim. Sell them at my seed shop, grow them every year. They are just really prolific and do well. In fact, I grew the Tiny Tims indoors this January 
um, into February and I grew them under just plain old shop white LED lights and I harvested tomatoes um, in February and March here. So maybe we'll end here because it's almost time. Uh, have you done any intentional videos on plant spacing and germination through harvest in the ground, raised beds, and see how it compares to the packet? So packet information, um, they cram so much in there and they're just giving you general guidelines. So yeah, it's true, but it's not absolute. So I plant stuff a lot more closely together. I've... Um, found that stuff grows well like i have corn growing now that's four inches apart six inches apart much closer than the eight inches it recommends so i don't find much value in them um in fact i have a seed what do i want to say i have 12 packs of seeds that say the rusted garden on there i did them with bentley seeds and you can find them at my um, seed and garden shop at the rustedgarden.com and there's a QR code on the back. And if you scan that, it takes you to a video of me explaining how do you plant the carrots or the radishes or the lettuce, etc. And the reason I came up with this set of seed packets is because the backs of the seed packets just aren't really good information. It's very generic. It's very general. So I would encourage people to plant some stuff more closely together. See how it does. Um, plant earlier or later. And again, journal because... The seed packet doesn't tell you a whole lot. All right, my Michelle, yeah, I think it is too late to plant corn. Uh, plant corn, you need a good 80 or 90 days. The corn that's in my garden now, I planted middle of July for a late fall harvest. Um, but they do like the warmth, and if you got frost rolling in, you probably don't have enough time. Fruit flies, I get often when I bring in tomatoes and cucumbers and all that kind of stuff. I set up uh, traps, vinegar in a small container, plastic over it, saran wrap, poke holes in it. Fruit flies will crawl into there, and they get trapped. Uh, and, right, why wouldn't the spacing be uniform. So when you're planting stuff like a radish, um, that's not a good example. Let's say lettuce. Say you're doing lettuce every six inches apart in a row. And that's enough spacing for the heads to form. If you put another lettuce next to it six inches, that's fine and you can do that. But it starts getting really crowded and they will grow. But if you get pest pressure or disease pressure, having the greater rows allow a bird to drop in and maybe it eats a snail or something because there's more space between the lettuce and animals can get in there wind can blow through there sunshine can get in there so it's for different reasons but depending on what you're growing and what kind of pest pressure you have um, you can put stuff much more closely together and you can do it uniform like you were saying all right let's call it a day i will see you guys for the public, uh, on the fourth Thursday at 11 o'clock.